Creative Power, Chapter 9, Dynamic Idealization. In the instruction contained in the several books of the series of which the present volume is a part, there is frequent reference made to the master formula of attainment, which is as follows. Number one, definite ideals. Number two, insistent desire. Number three, confident expectation. Number four, persistent determination. And number five, balanced compensation. The spirit of the master formula is expressed in the popular phrasing as follows. You may have anything you want, provided that number one, you know exactly what you want. Number two, you want it hard enough. Number three, you confidently expect to obtain it. Number four, persistently determined to obtain it. And five, are willing to pay the price of its attainment. In other books of the series, these several elements of the master formula are considered in detail, are fully explained, and methods for their effective application are indicated. In this concluding section of the present book, however, we ask you to consider the first element, i.e. that of definite ideals, from an angle somewhat different from that adopted in the other books of the series. In these other considerations of the subject of definite ideals, that important element of the master formula generally has been treated as practically synonymous with the idea of definite purpose. But definite purpose really is but one of the several phases or forms of definite ideals. The particular phase or form which is involved in the manifestation of willpower, to some extent in that of desire power, and in that of logical power. In faith power, however, there is manifest a somewhat higher form of definite ideals. Likewise, in some of the higher mental and spiritual activities, there is found present and active a transcendental phase or form of definite ideals. Thus, you see, the term definite ideals represents a general concept or idea which is several lesser elements. It includes the concept of definite purpose and also several other important secondary concepts. In our present consideration of the subject, we shall confine our attention to that aspect of definite ideals, which may be called creative ideals. The term is appropriate for the essential nature and characteristic activities of such ideals are primarily creative. Creative ideals call into operation the strongest and most intense activities of desire power the most earnest and inspiring faith power, the most persistent and determined willpower, the most capable and efficient subconscious power. In fact, it acts upon and through the most potent energies of all of the mental, emotional, and volitional elements of the mind, soul, or spirit of man. More than that, it reaches out into the great world beyond the personal limits of the individual, and operating through some of nature's subtle but potent forces, it sets into motion and activity many things, persons, events, causes, and processes over which, in the ordinary view, the individual apparently has no direct control. Perhaps it will be as well to begin by arriving at a clear and definite understanding of the term ideal as employed in this instruction. It has well been said that there is a mighty magic in words rightly understood. The old Chaldean oracle announced this ancient thought in these lines. There are names in every nation, God given of unexplained power in the mysteries. First of all, we find that our term has its origin in the term idea, which evolved from an old Greek word meaning to see. Idea is defined as one, a mental image of any visible object, object of sense or spiritual object. Number two, a general notion or a conception formed by generalization. Hence, three, any object apprehended, conceived or thought of by the mind. Also, number four, a belief, opinion, doctrine or principle. And five, a plan or purpose of action. Underlying all of these meanings is found the essential notion of existing in the mind. An idea is always mental, never material. The term ideal as an adjective means one existing in idea or thought. 
Two, existing in imagination only. And three, reaching an imaginary standard of excellence, efficiency, beauty, utility, etc. As a noun, the term is defined as a mental conception regarded as a standard of perfection, a model of excellence, beauty, efficiency, utility, etc. Here we have the blending of the two essential attributes. One, existing in thought or imagination, and two, a standard of excellence. Excellence is synonymous with superiority, worth, goodness, and greatness. So in the end, we have a concept of an ideal defined as a mental image of something of superior worth, goodness and value, serving as a standard of excellence, beauty, efficiency, utility, etc. As we always desire, hope for, and strive to attain things of superior worth, goodness, and value, the degree of worth, goodness, and value being determined by the comparative resemblance of such things to the accepted standard of excellence, beauty, efficiency, utility, etc. It follows that desire, faith, and will are always consciously or unconsciously striving to reach, achieve, or attain an ideal. To the end of such achievement or attainment, the forces of creative power, desire power, faith power, and willpower are set into activity. In many cases, the ideal manifests in the form of purpose or plan of action. One of the above definitions of idea, you will remember. But in other cases, it manifests rather as a mental or spiritual germ striving to express and manifest itself in objective material form, drawing to itself and reaching out after that which promises to contribute to or aid in such objective and material expression and manifestation. Here then we have the concept of the ideal seeking to express and manifest itself in objective and material expression and manifestation. And by reason of this inner urge, drawing to itself and reaching out after that which promises to contribute or aid in such expression and manifestation. But you may ask, why and how is this ideal entitled to be termed creative? Let us answer this question in the first place by asking you another question. Thinking over the subject discussed in the preceding section of this book, of what does this concept of this striving, seeking, acting, mental or spiritual germ remind you? We think that the following several paragraphs will represent the essence and spirit of your answer. You will be reminded first of all, of the fact that in all man's material creations, there has been and necessarily must have been a preceding mental image or form, an ideal in fact, of which the later material objective form of the created thing was merely a copy. That there must always be the mental pattern, map, design, or mold, which is reproduced in the material creation. There must always be the inner form before there can be the outer form. But you may object, here the ideal is merely the pattern, model, or mold, which the imagination and will employ in their creative work. The ideal in itself is not creative. That is true, at least to a certain extent. We need not here argue the fine distinctions, however, for we have a clear case presented in nature's activities to the consideration of which we shall now proceed. Letting your mind dwell upon this subject considered in the preceding section of this book, you will remember that in all material creations of form, in all purposive groupings, arrangements, confirmations, configurations, there is found to be present an inner ideal form, composed of the aggregate of mental forms striving to express itself in action and objective manifestation. You will remember that we found this inner ideal form operative in the cases of the groupings of the atoms and of the smaller particles composing the atoms, in all chemical processes, in the processes of crystallization, in the life processes and the growth of plants, in the sprouting of seeds, of the development and evolution of the germ in the egg. You will remember the interesting description of the development of the newt's egg given by Huxley. 
you will remember the instances of great power exerted by growing roots, plants, and sprouting seeds. You will remember what was said concerning the evolution of needed physical instruments manifested by the lower animals, the explanation of the long legs of the wading birds, the claws and beaks of the birds of prey, and long neck and legs of the giraffe. Finally, you will remember the logical conclusion arrived at by those observing these and similar instances of this wonderful working of nature's forces. That is, that there exists and is manifest in all nature, the operation of a mighty principle, which proceeds from the inner form to the outer manifestation, from the ideal image to its materialization in objective form. You will find yourself compelled to think that in all of nature's activities and processes in which is performed the work of creation of form, combination, composition, or coordination, there certainly exists an ideal form serving as a pattern, plan, mold, map, chart, or design upon which and by means of which nature builds and creates. More than this, when you carefully reason concerning this matter, you will find yourself becoming impressed by the idea and conviction that the essence and spirit of such manifestations and expressions abide in the germ ideal form itself and that instead of being a mere inert pattern, mold, or model, the ideal form is a living, acting, creative force, drawing to itself the materials needed for its outward objective expression and manifestation. Such expression and manifestation being the essential desire, need, and energizing principle of its being. Thus, the ideal form is seen to be not only an inner form, but also a something or somewhat, which may be described as a power with the desire to act or a desire with the power to act, a definition which has also been applied to will, it may be noted. Here once more is seen the close relation of imagination to will, a resemblance which by many philosophers and by all occultists is regarded as of the deepest significance. That there is a dynamic force in the ideal forms which are found to be present in nature's creative processes cannot be doubted. Everything points to this conclusion. You see. On all sides, proofs supporting this contention may be found. In nature, it is seen that there is a creative ideal form as the nucleus of every creative process. Forms, combinations, coordinated activities, arrangements of parts, elements, and factors of composition are found to group themselves around the nucleus furnished by the creative ideal. Just as the germ in the seed or egg gathers to itself the material that it needs for growth, just as the seed or egg freely employs the natural forces at its disposal, and they are always at its disposal, you should note, in order to manifest and express itself in creative growth. So in every creative ideal form, there is found to be present that power to employ natural forces for its purposes. The instinctive knowledge how and when to employ those forces efficiently and the desire, will and ability to draw to itself the material needed for its growth, development, expression and objective manifestation. Proceeding from the macrocosm to the microcosm, from nature to man, and applying the ancient hermetic axiom as above, so below, we would consider it logically certain that in man, the individual, we should find a corresponding condition of things, i.e. the presence and power of the creative ideal form. The action of the latter in the direction of drawing to itself the material required for its objective expression and manifestation and the capacity for employing natural forces for the purpose of accomplishing its ends. We should expect to find that in man as in nature, the creative ideal form not only seeks to express and manifest itself in objective form and action, but also actually does so express and manifest itself and also is able to press into its service the subtle forces of nature. Provided always that the creative ideal form be one sufficiently strong and active and two sufficiently clear and definite 
the spirit of the requirements being that of concentrated power. Conducting the above mentioned inquiry, we discover that we have not been deceived nor mocked. We find that the axiom as above, so below holds good in this as in many another case. We find that the men and women who have accomplished great things have always possessed these dynamic creative ideals and that those who have so possessed them have found operating within themselves a mighty power of nature and have been conscious of the effects of these activities manifesting in the world outside of themselves. The individuals of great attainments sooner or later have become aware of this correspondence between the inner dynamic creative ideal and the events and happenings of the outside world, which are correlated to the inner purpose. The individual with the dynamic creative ideal has established within himself a great focal center of energy and power. And to that center are being attracted and drawn things, persons, circumstances, thoughts, ideas, powers, and other things which are needed for the objective expression and manifestation of the inner ideal form. Even in the lesser activities of man, in the more mechanical forms of work, he is able to perform better work and to, form, and to perform his work more efficiently if he maintains a sufficiently clear and strong creative ideal form of that which he wishes to materialize in objective form. Psychologists have told us that the best workmen are those who visualize the whole of what they propose to do before they take a tool in their hands. This being equally true of strategists, artists of all kinds, physicists who contrive new experiments and all others who do not follow mere routine. They have told us, for instance, that no man can be a good plumber unless he uses his imagination. The ideal and its mental image must precede the actual laying of the pipe. Likewise, that the blacksmith is efficient only in the degree in which he employs his imagination. Every time he strikes the red hot iron, he makes it approximate the ideal image in his mind. K says a clear and accurate idea of what we wish to do and how it is to be effected is of the utmost value and importance in all of the affairs of life. A man's conduct naturally shapes itself according to the ideas in his mind. And nothing contributes more to success in life than having clear, strong ideals and keeping them continually in view. Numerous unexpected circumstances will be found to conspire to bring it about, and even what seems at first hostile may be converted into means for its furtherance. While by having the ideal constantly before the mind, one will ever be ready to take advantage of any favoring circumstances that may present themselves. Bain says, by aiming at a new construction, we must clearly conceive what is aimed at. Where we have a very distinct and intelligible model before us, we are in a fair way to succeed. In proportion, as the ideal is dim and wavering, we stagger and miscarry. John Burroughs says, no one ever found a walking fern who did not have the walking fern in his mind. A person whose mind is full of Indian relics, picks them up in every field through which he walks. They are found and quickly recognized because the eye has been commissioned to find them. In the great field of activities comprising the realm of desire, we find that the energizing force of desire is called forth in proportion to the degree of clearness, definiteness, and distinctness of the ideal presented to it. Desire always is called into action by the presence and power of ideas and ideals. Desire is always the want of this thing or the want to do that thing. It cannot want or want to unless an idea or ideal is present in sufficient force and definiteness to call forth its activities. In fact, a strong ideal often arouses and attracts to itself such a degree and amount of desire that the ideal itself seems to be but a focal point of desire or the desire seems to be the very soul of the ideal. In desire power, the dominant want or want to is the definite purpose. The idea of the achievement or attainment of the end of the want or want to is the definite ideal. Likewise, in the activities of faith power, 
there is always found present a definite ideal. Faith must always have its object. The more definite and certain its object, the greater and more stable is the faith. Faith is one of the great elemental spiritual powers. In its form of confident expectation and expectant attention, it powerfully moves the will. But faith power is but latent and static unless it be aroused into dynamic power by the presentation to it of an appropriate idea or ideal. Finally, the activities of willpower are called forth only in response to the idea or ideal, which has in the first place aroused the desire which rises into will, and which in the second place has served as a standard of measurement of will values, and which in the third place now serves as a beacon, a standard or mark placed far ahead on the path of attainment, serving to point out the way to be traveled and the direction to be followed. It is an axiom of psychology that the will goes out in action only toward an idea or ideal presented to it. It might be added that the will is held to its path only by the perception of the idea or ideal which marks its course and indicates its direction. Certain philosophers and psychologists have noted that it is almost impossible to distinguish between concentrated will and a highly developed definite concentrated idea or ideal. The two seem to have been combined and blended into one mental power. This correspondence between imagination and will frequently has been noted in the present work. But in pursuance of the rule of the unity of the mind, we find that just as truly as desire, faith, imagination, and the will may be and are called into action, power, and strength by the presentation of an idea or ideal, so it is true that the creative ideal may be strengthened, energized, and given definite form by the application of the respective powers of desire, faith, imagination, and will. There is always action, reaction, and interaction in the realm of the mind. Its powers are correlated and coordinated. Each is bound up with the others, and each aids and helps the others when needed. We may concentrate our attention upon any one of the great powers of the mind, and that particular power will seem to be the dominant one. When, however, we proceed to contemplate and to study the others, we find that each in turn seems to be the dominant power. The truth is that no one of these great powers can operate effectively unless the other powers cooperate with it and proceed with it in coordinated action. The creative ideal, in order to be effective, indeed in order to be truly creative, must be number one, strong, and number two, definite. Its strength is increased by the energizing power of desire, the inspiring power of faith, and the determining power of will. Moreover, by means of imagination presenting to it mental pictures of itself as actually expressed and manifested in objective material form, the creative ideal is further aroused into action in response to that essential urge, instinct, or appetency of its nature, which causes it to strive ever to manifest itself in outward action and form. In strengthening an ideal form, which you wish to rise to the rank and power of a dynamic creative ideal, you should bring to bear upon it the combined powers of your desire, faith, imagination, and will. The creative ideal, in order to be effective and truly creative, must be clear, positive, and definite. Here, the ideal calls upon those mighty twin elements of the spirit, the ideative and volitional faculties, namely, imagination and will. Imagination supplies the definite pattern, model, or design, which the ideal wishes to manifest, while will proceeds to cut away with the encumbering marble or granite, which hides the definite form of the ideal as represented by the artist's pattern, design, or mold. Will, however, does not create the ideal. The ideal is self-created or else is originally created by that I am I, which is the center and focal point present in the mental kingdom. But will serves a necessary purpose and an essential task when it proceeds to chip away, to chisel away, 
to hammer away all the great mass of mental granite or marble, which hides the beautiful inner form of the ideal, its pure form. The ideal form is actually existent, never forget that. But before it may be perceived and employed as a model, standard and guide, it must be released from that which encumbers its pure form and hides it from view. In the master formula of attainment, the first element is that of definite ideals, not merely ideals, but particularly definite ideals. In all of the principal books of this series, this element of definite ideals is dwelt upon at considerable length in one form or another. In the preceding sections of the present book, you will find it presented under the form of definite purpose. The factor of definiteness is emphasized in all such presentations for upon such definiteness depends much of the power of the ideal standard or purpose. It must stand out in attention, perception and thought. It must represent the just what of the want, ambition, faith, effort or thought. It denotes just what you like, desire, believe in, adopt as a standard of values, use as your guide on the road of attainment and strive to manifest and express in thought, word and deed. An ideal standard or purpose is definite in the degree in which it is certain, clear, plain, distinct, specific, exact, precise, fixed in understanding and meaning. Its mental form must be distinct, clear, sharp, clear cut, sharp cut. Indistinctness, indefiniteness, ambiguity, uncertainty, vagueness, and obscurity of understanding and meaning are to be avoided in your ideals. That is, if you wish to have them creative and dynamic. Strong and definite creative ideals are properly called dynamic ideals, for they manifest all the qualities and powers which are indicated by the term dynamic. Dynamic means powerful, filled with energy, capable of manifesting force, energy, power, motion, and action. The dynamic aspect or phase of anything is that in which the thing manifests motion, action, activity. Its static aspect or phase is that in which it exists in a state of rest and inaction. Your dynamic ideals are those ideals existing in your mind which are one, sufficiently powerful to move into action and to manifest their inherent force and energy. And two, sufficiently definite to concentrate those forces and energies into a one-pointed focus of idea and will. Only a dynamic ideal can be a creative ideal and all dynamic ideals are and must be creative ideals by reason of their very nature. The dynamic ideal must create for creative activity is its essential nature. Creation, as you know, consists of compounding, composing, building, putting together, making, manufacturing new forms from the materials at hand. The dynamic ideal tends to express and manifest itself in creating a new environment for its possessor in building a new set of conditions for him. Such environment and conditions, however, being in harmony and agreement with the spirit of the ideal. In short, the dynamic ideal tends toward making the ideal become real. In building up a material world of experience corresponding to its inner mental world of experience, it experiments in order to build up the experience. It tears down, rebuilds, builds anew, just as the mind of the inventor, the artist, the writer, proceeds in creating its particular form of expression. The dynamic creative ideal, in fact, is composed of two associated elements, namely A, the element of definite and concentrated idea, and B, the element of definite and concentrated will. The idea plans, invents, and points out the direction of the action. The will executes the action according to the plan thus furnished it. This brings us back once more to the teachings of the ancient occultists who held that at the last, there are but two fundamental mental or spiritual forces. And these really are but twin aspects of spirit. 
These two fundamental forces or aspects are number one, imagination which was held to involve all thinking, reasoning, and mental imaging of any sort. And two, will, which was held to involve all feelings and designs, all voluntary action, all determination, judgment, decision, and volition. All other mental faculties or powers were held to be but A, phases or derivative forms of imagination or will, or B, combinations and compositions of imagination and will in which the elements of each are blended. In that book in this series entitled Personal Power, we have shown you that the twin giants of personal power are ideation, volition, or in other words, idea, will. The more you ponder over this teaching, the stronger will grow your conviction of the underlying identity of ideation and volition that imagination and will are twin giants, inseparable, always operating in conjunction with each other. This being so, you will begin to understand how and why a strong, vigorous, definite ideal may become a dynamic, creative ideal by means of calling into operation and effect its twin aspect of dynamic will. For the purposes of easy thought on the subject, and the manifestation of this principle, you may think of the dynamic creative ideal as having the soul of idea and the bodily strength of will. You may render your ideals dynamic and creative by means of the employment of desire, faith, imagination, and will. Applying the principle of the master formula, you one must know exactly what you want that creative ideal to be. Two, you must desire insistently that it be such. Three, you must confidently expect that it will be such. Four, you must persistently determine that it will be such. And five, you must pay the price of work, service, application, concentration, and of the relinquishment of opposing ideas and ideals, desires, and feelings. By means of insistent desire, confident expectation and persistent determination, the creative ideal may be raised to the rank and power of dynamic idealization. Keep your creative ideals always before you. Think of them, dream of them, make them a part of your very soul. Encourage them by visualizations of their realization in objective form. Brace them with affirmations. Give to them the force of habit by endeavoring to act upon their principles as often and so far as is possible. Think, feel, and act in their terms. Assimilate them to such an extent that your personal, mental, and physical instruments of expression may become their outward machinery. Let even your personal being become as the willing instrument of the manifestation into objective form of these dynamic creative ideals. Live for the purpose of making your ideals become real. What will be the result of the creation and maintenance of such dynamic creative ideals? You may ask. Here is the answer of those wise and illumined members of the race who established the esoteric schools of ancient philosophy and of the equally wise and illumined members of the race of today who are striving to sow the seeds of the inner teachings in the minds of those who are prepared to receive them, nourish them, and allow them to develop, grow, and bear blossom and fruit. Here is the answer of such great souls. You are the creator of your own world of experience. Consciously or unconsciously, you are molding your world of experience and determining your own destiny. In ignorance or in wisdom, for good or for evil, you are creating, building, constructing the scenery of that world in which you live and move and have your being. For weal or for woe, you are thus building. For better or for worse, you are thus constructing. Your personal world of experience is largely what you yourself have made it. Your ideals ever tend to become real. You are always realizing your ideals. What you have been doing unconsciously, you may now proceed to do consciously. By creating and controlling your ideals, you create and control your world of experience. You may become an active master of creation instead of a passive slave.
The strong, definite, dynamic, creative ideal will call forth the full powers of your body, of your mind, and of your spirit. Reason, imagination, invention will perform their best work under its influence. Desire will energize more intensely and will, will determine more persistently under its influence. The wonderful storehouse of the subconscious will open wide its doors when the creative ideal gives the right knock. The still higher realm of the superconscious will superimpose its wisdom and knowledge upon the conscious mind when this be demanded by the dynamic ideal. All things will work together for good for him in whom the dynamic creative ideal is manifesting its power. I call them all forth and forth come they in answer to my call, says the spirit of the ideal in the old allegory of the Orient. And chief of all, and the first to come forth is my twin brother, Will, concludes that ideal spirit. Definite ideal and concentrated will, these are the twin giants of your creative power. Cultivate and develop both of them, and to an equal extent. Do not let your definite ideals suffer by reason of the lack of pulling and pushing power of your concentrated will. Neither let your concentrated will become static and inert by reason of the lack of the directing and guiding power of your definite ideals. Grasp the hands of the twin giants, one on the right and the one on your left, and then let the IMI give the command forward march. Not can oppose the phalanx composed of your definite ideals, your real self, your concentrated will. Rightly may such a combination shout its battle cry, I can, I will, I dare, I do. The will that can is the will that knows. The ancient Buddhists had an old aphorism, which ran something like this, to know rightly is to think rightly. To think rightly is to will rightly. To will rightly is to act rightly. The root of action is knowledge. The fruit of knowledge is action. The ancient Chaldeans had a similar proverb. He who knows is able to will effectively. He who wills effectively creates his world. All through the secret doctrines runs this song of ideal will, of knowing and doing. And the most practical thinkers of our own times and lands echo the ancient reports. Perhaps the highest phases of philosophical and metaphysical thought are those which hold that the only adequate explanation of the universe is to be had in that hypothesis which postulates the existence of an eternal, infinite spiritual principle, the essence of which is life, will, and ideative consciousness, the essential powers of which are animation, ideation, and volition, respectively. In this view, universal creation, creative evolution, is accomplished by means of the power of the living will, taking the forms and configurations patterned by the living idealizing power. Daring thinkers have likened the universe to a cosmic dramatization of the ideas and ideals evolved by the infinite consciousness of spirit. The machinery of creation being operated by the infinite will of spirit be this as it may, every careful and honest thinker has been compelled, at least at times, to admit that there is no escape from the conviction that the universe shows the progressive willing out and manifestation of a cosmic purpose, intention, end, aim, in short, that the universe is the materialization of a pre-existing cosmic idea or ideal. The processes of cause and effect show the presence and operation of something like pure deductive logic in the activities of the universe. Many poets, writers, and dramatists have pointed out that in the processes of the universe, there is manifested the presence and action of something that might be called the author, a something or somewhat that develops a cosmic plot of creation and then does logically, consistently, and artistically proceeds to perform the work of material evolutionary creation upon the lines of that ideal plot. They point out that the characters, circumstances, actions, and events of the universe always hang together, 
always manifesting that unity, coherence, and balance which distinguish the literary compositions of the best writers. This lofty conception may be but the fanciful expression of the perception by competent observers of that something at work in the universe, which bears a close resemblance to the something at work in their own minds. Or again, it may be the result of a deep intuition of truth. Whatever it may be at the last, it certainly expresses a conviction that has come to many deep thinkers in all ages and all lands, many of whom had never heard the like expression of others of their kind. Whatever may be the ultimate truth, it is certain that man has at his disposal a mighty creative power, which in its more familiar phases is called constructive imagination, and which in its less familiar esoteric transcendental phase is called what? Man in his own realm is a creator and the limits of his realm are determined by himself, by his imagination, by his will.